Thank you very much, folks, and thank you very much for having me. This is exciting, right? Uh, I know there's some there's some there's some pretty pretty intense folks on the call. Hey, what's up, Thomas? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's crazy. I can see my wife is on the call as well. This is terrible. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I've got Carsten. Man, every time Carsten, every time Carsten's on a call, I, I'm like, oh damn, I better behave myself. <laughs> so do you guys mind? I'm just going to quickly share my screen. Uh, hopefully you can see that. There's a little picture of a creature, right? Yes. Cool, cool. All right. So I, I'm I'm not gonna do I'm not gonna do what every person does in these sessions. Um, I'm not gonna go into slide deck mode. I'm just gonna keep it like this if that's okay. And I'll probably uh, I don't have two screens because I'm currently at the college, so I'll probably like look for the messages in the chat. But if I could just ask, um, if I miss a question, maybe um, Costin or Nicole or somebody, would you guys mind just shouting or coming off mute and asking it if I don't see it? Is that okay? Shop. All righty. <laughs> legends, legends. Thank you guys very much. Okay, so basically, uh, I want to give you a little bit of a history on this one. And I'm sorry, I don't have the um, the Dateland slides. And I just want to say thank you to the organizers for having me, um, Jürgen. Jorgen called me up uh, yesterday and said, hey, man, do you want to do a session? And I was like, yes, I like talking, so let's do this thing. <laughs> so I'm going to do a session on a thing called the Notorious Data Debate. And I know Carsten has sat through this a couple of times, so um, he can keep me honest. And also, I will throw in some licensing uh, jargon over here, purely because of the fact that I know they've made a new release. And uh, it's pretty scary around the Power Platform. Anyway, I apologize for the corporate slides. Please ignore them. But there's a couple of things I want to bring up, right? First things first. So some of you went to Ignite, and it was awesome, right? We went to Ignite. Well, didn't go to Ignite. We watched Ignite. Some of you went into that weird virtual mesh thing. It was freaking creepy. But yeah, it is what it is. No arms. Yeah. <laughs> but um, a couple of things that are crazy at the moment. You know, Sachin Adela said that roughly 500 million new apps will be built in the next five years. And that that I think he said that in like 2020 or 2019, something like that. Anyway. You know, forget the figures, right? 95% of stats are made up on the spot anyway, aren't they? So he said that 500 million new apps will be created. That's cool. I get it. 500 million new apps. Everyone's waffling on about apps, apps, apps. I don't really want to talk about apps today. I want to talk about solutions, okay? Because apps are one single digital building brick in the Power Platform. It's, it's one tiny little thing, right? So solutions, right? Whenever I say the word apps, I should pay you a fine or buy you a beer or something. We're going to talk about solutions, and the second thing that we know is that by roughly 2024, low-code uh, will basically cater for roughly 65% of the solutions that are built. Now, the reason for this is because there's a thing called, and I've got to say this in movie voice, the great developer shortage. <laughs> and what that basically means is that there's a whole load of people who used to code and still kind of code now, but we're not bringing new developers into the market, and therefore we don't have the ability to build out these solutions, right? So we have to have a, have to have a way to create them. And when you look at the Microsoft Power Platform, it's a really great way to build out these solutions. Now, before I get into this whole data nonsense, I've got to give you a I've got to give you a bit of a heads up here. When you're looking at the Power Platform, Microsoft continuously throw around the term digital transformation. So if you're playing buzzword bingo, bing, bing, digital transformation, you can cross one off your sheet, right? Now, it's it's kind of true, though, because organizations are being forced to transform the way they work. Now, that's either through the change of like a chief technology officer, through acquisition, through penalties or being fined for the way that they treat their data, et cetera, et cetera. And actually, it's getting quite scary, right? If you look at the way that um, organizations are functioning right now, people have to, have to, have to, have to respect their data. I still walk into organizations who think Excel is a database. It's really not, okay? I still walk into organizations who think SharePoint's the best place for all their information. <laughs> no, okay? So we're going to talk a little bit around this data, but it's very key to understand that the Power Platform is the layer that lives on top of data, right? So when you start thinking about why people um, need to take the platform seriously, think about things like Shadow IT, where all these organizations have hundreds of Excel documents living in all these weird file repositories, right? And people are storing their random information inside these documents, all these rogue SharePoint lists that are flying all over businesses unprotected, all these random access databases. And yes, I respect access. You know, We have to say that it was a great tool in its time. But at the same time, it's not the right place to be putting all of your information. Also, people are downloading weird stuff off the internet, like Zoho CRM. Not that weird stuff that you're thinking, <laughs> behave yourselves. Other weird stuff, right? 
they're putting the data in disrespected locations, right? Locations that their data is not really kind of respected. And that's really important for you to understand. It's all about data. I remember going to one of these um, events called Future Decoded in London. And it, it made me laugh, eh? Because somebody, I think, I can't remember. I think it was Claire Barclay. I don't know, Cindy Rose. One of these Microsoft people got on stage and they were like, data is digital gold. And at the time, I thought, yeah, that's just another one of those Microsoft marketing terms. But actually, it wasn't. It's really true because data is digital gold. And if you're putting a layer on top of data and the data is not respected, there's no point in building an app. It means nothing to me, right? So here's the thing. When Microsoft started looking at all these digital transformation challenges, when they started looking at shadow IT and all these people using all these weird systems and all these paper processes flying around, I mean, Paper's fine, except for where there's fire and it's raining. Okay, so yeah, start thinking about using you know other solutions for paper. Also, we want to save the rainforest, right? Anyway, budget constraints. We need to find a way to build things quicker. So Microsoft introduced this thing, and you all know what it is, the Power Platform. All right, and there is a hilarious thing on the slide, and I'm probably going to get into trouble. Carsten, you're allowed to reprimand me anytime you want. <laughs> However, when you look at the platform, right, Microsoft basically leveraged a bunch of technology that they already had. Now, everyone knows the Power Platform for Power BI, Power Apps, Power Automate, and Power Virtual Agents. Awesome. Just so you guys just saw a really great session around some of the conversational um, functionality. Uh, the app layer, fantastic. You know, oh, yay, Power Apps, cool, cool, cool. But what's really important here is the data layer. And um, when we start thinking about why data is really important, you know, we'll, and I'll get into this shortly, it is the thing that basically runs the world of Power Platform. Now, obviously, Microsoft knew that, and they knew that very clearly, so they started establishing these data connectors. And these data connectors gave us the ability to connect out to all these really amazing solutions. Um, um, I, I actually got to pay respect to my wife here. She was doing a session with um, one of the Ignite people, and they said there were 275 connectors. And she was like, I'm sure that's wrong. And that is wrong. There are more than 550 by now, I think. Uh, so yeah, and anyway, you know, we've got all these connectors that connect out to these amazing solutions and services. Awesome. The next thing that's really important about the data piece is the fact that Microsoft have infused artificial intelligence. And Ryan Cunningham said it perfectly in a session at Ignite. He said, AI is now a byproduct. It's something that has to be there all the time. You know, before, we used to freak out about artificial intelligence. We used to think that Arnold Schwarzenegger was going to bust through the clouds and start killing Terminators, and Skynet would take over the world. But it's not that. AI is happening right now, folks. Those of you that are on Tinder right now are using AI. Those of you playing Candy Crush during the session, you're using artificial intelligence. And then Microsoft introduced Common Data to Oak and XRM Flexi Serviceverse, or whatever we're calling it this week. I think it's Dataverse now, right? Um, the great ceiling fan icon. And Dataverse effectively is the is the go-to cloud-based relational data storage facility to put data. I did not call it a database. I never will call it a database. It is not a database. It is a data storage facility. The reason for that is because a database is a thing that holds some data. This does far more than that, right? So ultimately, that's kind of the go-to layer. And then you have your interaction layer on the top, which is quite cool, right? So data at the bottom is the foundation interaction layer at the top. I'm always surprised as to why people pay so much attention to the Power App and forget about the data. And, and that's the thing that always bothers me. Your app is useless without data. So is your report. So ultimately, when I start thinking about the Power Platform and why it's relevant, data is the first thing that came and comes into my mind. One thing that I also found very interesting, and uh, some of you folk on the call uh, will know this, so let me just check. Yeah, some of, I know Alex is on the call as well. I think I said this to Alex some time back. When Microsoft released the platform, the whole goal was not about building apps. The whole goal was about managing and respecting data and leveraging data in a business. You know, when you look at the amount of data in organizations, it's massive. It's absolutely massive. There's just data everywhere. The crazy thing is that, yes, I'm obsessed with Lego, right? The crazy thing is that when you look at all that data and when you look at the availability of data, here's a stat that's actually true, by the way. Organizations only leverage roughly 30% of the data they have in, in, inside their business. Don't know if you guys knew that. So what are they doing with the other 70, 75% of it, right? They're not using it. That data is digital gold. That lady that said it at Future Decoded was 100% correct. Leveraging your data 
is a really, really great way to actually start making more money, providing more time to people to do things. And Microsoft did something really clever here. They recognized the pattern in the way that the data was being run and all the experiences were being used in organizations. So because of that, they said, okay, well, you know, we're finding all these common points and we're finding all these common uh, common patterns in the data. So we're going to lump them into these various areas, okay? And we're going to call them Azure and Microsoft 365 and business applications. I hate to say to you folks, but the Power Platform is just made of these three digital building bricks. Microsoft used to call it the three clouds, which is definitely the dumbest thing I've ever heard. It's one cloud, right? So we're competing against people like Amazon and Google. So it's one cloud. They have one cloud. We have one cloud. James Phillips said it at Ignite. We have one cloud, okay? So no, no more of this three cloud nonsense. And these, these, these areas within the platform, these areas within the Microsoft cloud gave us the power platform. These things that you're seeing here are made from these digital building bricks, okay? So that's really important. So this isn't all new and shiny. A lot of the stuff's been around for a long time. Things like Dataverse have been around for, I don't know, since 2005 or four, something like that. It's not new stuff, right? A lot of this is just repalatable. It's just rebuilt functionality that has been given to users in a more palatable format, citizen developers, okay? And I love the fact that Microsoft have this motto, and I actually respect this a whole load, where they say, their mission is to empower every person on the planet and every organization on the planet to do more, which I love, right? I think that's absolutely amazing. Giving people the ability to do more with a platform that can solve technical problems in the business. Okay, but remember I told you about those digital transformation challenges and I told you that organizations really struggle to be able to grasp onto this purely because of the fact that they don't have the time or money, et cetera, et cetera. So what do you do? You turn everyone into makers. Right. And if any of you have ever been on a call with me, you'll see that this is actually within uh, in my office. OK. And uh, this is one of the things that sits as one of my backdrops. It's quite cool. I kind of dig it. And uh, yeah, my wife had to sit with me one day watching me painstakingly spend hours building this. OK, it didn't take that long, but it was quite cool. Right. So I'm a maker. I like to make things. I like to build solutions. I like to build apps and flows and all sorts of delightful things. Right. That solve problems for me. At the moment, I'm a real massive nerd. So I'm going to show you guys something. I haven't finished it yet. At the moment, I'm studying a thing called a thin section in mineralogy. And um, basically, you have to describe the thin section. So I'm building an app that allows me to manage the ability to capture information about thin sections in astrophysics. Okay. Sounds nerdy. It is. I'll take it. Right. So that's one of the things I'm doing with the Power Platform. But what I know at the root of every single discussion I have in the platform is data. Okay. Uh, this is also a joke slide, by the way, because some of you will recognize this, the digital feedback loop. And it's kind of funny because when this slide builds, <laughs> it drops a little data dump over here. Boom, right. It looks like a little drone doing something filthy. And um, data is at the core and the heart of every single thing we do, right? Everything, absolutely everything. When you take a look at a Power BI report without data, look, I mean, look at the sad little spaceman over there. Okay. It's kind of boring. It's irrelevant. It means nothing. Agreed? Data is at the heart of absolutely every single thing we do. A report without data means nothing. A report supercharged with data means everything. When you take a look at an app with no data, oh, sad spaceman over there, okay? An app with no data, you may as well build a PowerPoint presentation. An app with data is a whole different ball game. And this is where it starts getting interesting, right? Data is at the absolute heart of everything. Now, that being said, some of you may know me from uh, having fights on Twitter. So yes, my name is Chris Huntingford. I'm known as that platform guy. I used to be the tattooed CRM guy for obvious reasons, except for me, I don't do CRM anymore. I do platforms. And many years ago, <laughs> some of you will remember this on this call, some of you won't. Um, we used to have a thing where uh, we used to call it the great data wars. And um, when Microsoft Dynamics released CRM 2011, and then there was integration to SharePoint and SharePoint had lists and then everyone loved SQL. We always used to fight about where data should be put. So we got some SharePointers on the call and you'll absolutely 100% say that everything should live in SharePoint, right? And then you'll argue with me about licensing. And then we'll have some people on the call that'll say everything should live in Dataverse, right? And then we'll have an argument about data storage and costs and capacity. 
and then we'll have another discussion about where everything uh, everything should live in SQL, and then we'll have a discussion about technical debt and the way that people build out these SQL data structures and how much work it takes. Right now, I was one of those people. I'm a Dataverse fan. Okay, you can you can try and dissuade me as much as you want. I think it's the greatest data storage facility in the world, and I love it. Right, I hated SharePoint, and genuinely I hated it. I thought it was the biggest waste of time in the world. Then. I got into a discussion with my buddy, Paul Cumsey, and he's, a, he's an MVP, right? So one, one day, him and I got into a call. I'd had way too much beer, and we got into a fat debate about um, data and data storage. And we started doing a session called Data, Beer, and Devil Horns. And the reason we called it that is because we're metalheads. We love hardcore rock and roll. Sorry for those of you on the call that don't, you know. Anyway, and uh, him and I got into this debate. And Paul was saying to me, listen, dude, you've got to start seeing past this Dataverse stuff. And I'm like, Paul, you've got to start looking at Dataverse. And this guy, by the way, he's such a legend. Um, he's written a book as well. If you just Google him, Paul Cumsey, I'll put his um, link in the chat. Or if somebody wouldn't mind just popping the, his Twitter handle in there if you, if you could find him. Paul wrote a book. And Paul wrote a book about um, adoption and best practice around um, solutioning. right? And he taught me something very interesting around problem solving. And I've got to give it to him, man. This guy knows his stuff. And what I learned is that I can't keep on looking at the data structures and the data storage facilities in the same way. So I had to think, and I was like, you know what? We architect solutions using technology we understand, but often let budgets stand in the way of the value. Okay. Now, normally, I would show you a really terrible t tattoo on my right arm and explain to you why you should never pay, you know, do things on the cheap. But uh, yeah, it's cold in here, so I'm not going to do that. <laughs> but let me explain to you, right? I'll explain my lunacy. Typically, when we talk about um, architecting solutions in the Power Platform, what normally happens is that you go to somebody that does modern workplace, and they'll say to you, hey, man, we built this app, and it's a Canvas app, and we've got 38 SharePoint lists in it. And I'm like, oh, dude, what have you done? But then... We go to another person, they're like, hey, we've built this app and it's on, it's got massive amounts of common uh, of dataverse tables. And I'm like, okay, why? So what I normally do is I step back and I ask people, why have you built it like that? All right. And it typically comes down to a discussion like this. We get into this discussion and people were like, hey, I use SharePoint because it's cheap uh, and or it's free. Can I tell you something? Nothing's free. If it's free, you are the product. Okay. So always question that. So I start thinking about why did they build it that way? So SharePoint lists. Okay, we built up the SharePoint lists because they're included in Office. Um, you know, the connector can't be blocked by data loss prevention. Red flag, big one. Okay. Uh, we, we, it's, it's, we can secure it to an extent. Okay, cool. You can, absolutely. And yeah, it's easy to manage. You don't have to move it with solutions. Okay, cool, 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 cool yeah. Um, what type of people are accessing that, that solution? Oh, no, no. You know, um, could be anyone in the business. Okay, I get that, right? Great, great choice. Then we got Dataverse for Teams or Project Oakdale. Um, and I ask people, what do you do? You know, why would you use that? What's the point? Oh, no, because it's localized in Teams and it's easy to do with citizen developers can easily build solutions. And then I ask people about why they use SQL. And it's because that's the thing that they understand, right? It's, it's technical. It's easy. If, if you're a techie, building stuff on SQL is simple, right? And then, you know, obviously on-premise data sources, we're not going to get into that in this discussion. But, you know, you have these people that think leaving their, their information on-premise is a good idea. <laughs> I'm not even going to have the argument, right? Just, just understand that that was a very sarcastic grunt at the end of that. Uh, what I will tell you is that if you're looking at security, Microsoft's pit bulls and ninjas are way bigger than anyone else's, right? So <laughs> it's more secure with Microsoft than anywhere in the world. And then Dataverse, right? You've got the Dynamics folks that build everything on Dataverse and won't look at a SharePoint list. I totally get that. I totally understand it. I was one of those people that would never look at any other data storage facility. In fact, I would actually, I would get angry if people said to me, build it on SharePoint. I'll just get so cross and say to them, hey, man, why would I do that? You know, I don't, I don't understand it. I don't respect that at all. And then Paul and I had that chat. And Paul said to me, dude, start looking at the use case and stop looking at it from a technical perspective. And I thought, actually, you know what? This guy's really got a point. Okay. So I had to put my pride aside and start looking at it from a use case perspective. And, you know, we ran through a bunch of different use cases together and we were talking about things like time and expense and health and safety. We had a kudos app, um, which is quite cool. You know, everyone loves a good old kudos app and then things like antisocial behavior. And how would I use the power platform to solve those problems? 
how would I leverage the data within the platform to solve those problems? And I got thinking and I'm like, okay, well, first of all, I know I have to make sure this is a use case based decision. So let's take a look at some of the data storage facilities that I have available to me. So I started thinking about the use cases and I realized that number one, Excel is not a database. Okay. Excel is cool for doing uh, spreadsheet type stuff. You know, at the moment, this is going to be the baseline for my app around examining my different rocks and minerals and doing stars and stuff. But, you know, Excel's cool for that, right? It's a really great tool, but everything for everything in Excel for me is an app, right? It's an opportunity for an app. But then I start looking at tools like SharePoint and I start thinking, well, you know, there are limitations. Like SharePoint's a really rock solid tool. One thing people won't tell you is that the search functionality in SharePoint is probably some of the best in the world, okay? And uh, I know Dataverse will get there at one point. No, it won't. I don't know, maybe. We'll see. Okay, but SharePoint's a great way to start your solution build, right? And it's a great way to kind of, you know, when you're looking at it from a personal team's productivity perspective, awesome set of uh, set of functionality. Then Dataverse for Teams. I'm going to do my level best to be nice about this because I'm really struggling um, with the functionality in Dataverse for Teams. But I think it's a great way to build out those enterprise-grade solutions really quickly, but you have to bear in mind the security model. Okay, so I always think about security when I'm using Dataverse for Teams. And uh, at the moment, I kind of feel like most of the stuff I do lands up in Dataverse, right? Purely because of the fact that Dataverse for Teams, it's just, for me, it's, it's, it's like a non-starter in my world. It won't be for you. It will be something that you use. But for me, it's not necessarily the thing I use all the time. Dataverse, great set of functionality. But then I start thinking about the amount of transactional data that might get put in there. And if you're thinking about millions of rows, let me tell you, Dataverse can handle it, but can your pockets handle it? Can you handle the cost, right? And that's where you have to look at tools like SQL and using things like the Azure Data Lake and virtual entities, okay? Now, most people will look at this chart and say, I'm going to build my solution on top of one of those, all right? Okay, I want you to just remember that, on top of one of those. Now, what I want you to think about is this. When you're building solutions, who is going to be using them. So think about the use cases, right? Think about the use cases. Organization wide, everyone is going to need that. This is going to be a target audience. That's going to be a team audience. That's going to be a very specific audience, right? So who is going to be using your solution? Think about that for a second. Think about the amount of data you're going to be putting in. This, this slide, I love this slide. I actually think this might have come out of Carsten or Kim's, um, Kim's warehouse or one of the two, I don't know. But um, Kim Dupois, if you guys don't know him, Google the dude, he's awesome. He's in Carsten's team, absolutely amazing. So I love this slide. And the reason I love it is that this is word complexity. Okay. <laughs> and I always, I always think about this and I'm like, hey, define complexity for me. Define the concept of complexity. And people are like, hey, it's uh, the amount of data. I'm like, but that doesn't make it complex. It's the relational data model. That still doesn't make it complex. It's the amount of code you write. Okay, that might make it complex, but it's not the only thing. Complexity is a varying scale. It's something that can't necessarily be defined unless you have a set of criteria. So I just want you to think about that for a second. Okay, complexity in your brain is different to complexity in my brain, is different to complexity in a citizen developer's brain. All right, so please bear that in mind. So when people are building solutions, their version of complexity is different to yours. So if somebody says, my app or solution is very complex, in your brain, it might be a simple business case. And this is where as architects, as people that are trusted solution architects, you have to come to the party and start advising people, okay? So when I look at organizations, um, roughly 80% of the solutions are typically built as what we call personal productivity or team productivity solutions, okay? So my colleague, Simon Owen, um, he's not on the call now, but when he was at GSK, he'll tell you that most of the solutions landed up in that sort of 80% bracket. That's awesome. That means that citizen developers are building kick-ass stuff, right? Phenomenal, phenomenal, phenomenal. However, <laughs> people often put the Power Platform into that category. They often think the Power Platform is just for personal productivity or just for team productivity. That's nonsense. That's not true. The Power Platform can solve pretty much any kind of use case you allow it to solve. Okay, and that's where you have to start thinking out the box from a build perspective. So actually, if you look at the Power Platform, Dynamics 365, when I look at tools from the customer engagement suite, like field service and customer service, those are mission critical, complicated solutions. They are power apps. Okay, well, for the most part, I'm not talking about the AI bits. Okay, they are model driven applications. 
they're built with the same digital building bricks as you build your model driven and canvas apps with, right? Which is pretty cool. So think about that for a second and think about the fact that these solutions are not only personal productivity, but they are also mission critical organization wide initiatives. Now that changes the whole thing. The reason it changes the whole thing is because you as designers have to start thinking about where you put your data and also start thinking about how you respect your data. Let me explain something to you very quickly. If I put my personal PII information inside SharePoint and I put your HR and payroll information inside SharePoint, <coughs> inside a list, are you guys okay with that? Is that cool? Can I put it inside a list and share it with the rest of the organization? Hells no, hell no, okay? You don't do that. And if you do, you secure the hell out of that list in whatever way, shape, and form you can, and I still wouldn't put it there. I would start thinking about a more robust data storage facility like SQL or Dataverse. But here's another thing. If I build myself a Kudos app with like two tables and I use Dataverse, that's like buying a Ferrari and driving it two meters down the road every day. Yeah, it'll look cool. Yeah, everyone will love it. Is it going to be expensive and a waste of money? Yes, very likely. <laughs> not saying you can't do it. I'm saying, well, you know, is the juice worth the squeeze, so to speak? Is it worth buying that? Is it worth doing it like th that way? And that's why I keep on saying to folks, just respect the data, architect the solutions, respect the data, and make sure that you're not trying to put difficult things into simple things and vice versa. Okay. I remember when I was working at Microsoft, somebody came up to me, and I'm not going to say, uh, you probably don't know them anyway, but um, they said to me, I've built an app with 20 different SharePoint lists or something like that. I can't remember the number. It was well high. And they were talking to me about how they were moving data between the SharePoint lists using Power Automate and how they were struggling with relationships. And I said, okay, awesome solution, respect. How much time have you spent on it? And they said, oh, no, no, I've spent loads and loads of time. And I said, okay, give it to me. And I mocked the entire thing up in Dataverse in less than four hours. Okay. As an organization, if you are a customer or a partner, okay, you need to respect the customer, is, the customer essentially is going to either give Microsoft money for licensing or you money for services. And it's not cool if you're basically going to customers and saying, okay, we're going to do it the long way just to get the extra cash. That shouldn't be it, right? So customers, if you're on the call, you're going to end up paying for something. You're either going to pay for a license or you're going to pay for services. It's one of the two, right? You just got to pick who you want to give your money to. You either pay for the licensing for premium and build the solution properly, or you pay for a partner to muck around in SharePoint all day or you know, build this in Excel for you and spend hours and hours building our solution that will actually end up creating technical debt for you. Okay, So use the right data storage facility when building out your solutions. As an example, and this is where I'll give you my example of my four, my four um, various solutions, it's never just one answer. It can't just be one answer. God, imagine everything had just one answer. Man, I mean, it just doesn't make sense, right? So like, let me give an example. We were talking about T&E, and Paul and I were throwing around how um, we could do time and expense on the cheap, okay? And we were like, hey, you know, we could probably capture time inside a SharePoint list and then uh, archive it up to Excel. As on, ah, bad Chris, Excel, no ways. Archive, archive it up to SQL and then do the reporting on top of SQL. That would probably work. Don't know how secure it would be. We'd have to test it. Things for the Kudos app, right? One of the ones that I love, um, at Microsoft, we had this awesome Kudos app. I don't know who built it, but I've got to respect them. And <laughs> it was quite cool. So I think, um, you know, doing Kudos, logging Kudos records inside SharePoint, because it's quite basic stuff, or doing it in things like Dataverse for Teams, right? That would be a really great place to do a solution like that. Not hugely complex. Uh, you know, the table structure isn't massive, not massive, massive amounts of security. You might get lots of records, though which is quite cool. So you could whack that into Dataverse for Teams. One of the big ones with health, was health and safety. <laughs> I did this in South Africa. And do you know the health and safety records, they need create, read, update, delete auditing on the records. I'm not putting that stuff in SharePoint. I'll put the documents in SharePoint, right? But the data, that data can go legal, right? You actually have to have that data relevant at every time and you have to be able to keep it for 10 years as well, okay? So I was like, yeah, I'll put the, do the documents in SharePoint because the quality search functionality and data and um, unstructured data storage. But then, you know, use Dataverse as the mechanism to capture this information and store it. The other one I worked on in the UK, this one was absolutely nuts, was um, antisocial behavior. So um, during COVID, actually, a lot of, and this is very sad, and I'm sorry to bring it up, a lot of domestic abuse cases were raised, okay? And um, they were reported to local governments and what we call housing associations in the UK. 
and it was a bit crazy because actually that data that data really 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 needed to be um that data really really needed to be stored correctly and managed correctly and also it would go to the courts as well so that data every single time somebody opened that record you needed to be able to tell you also needed to be able to tell any create uh, any creator or updates on that that data we also needed to obfuscate personal information on that record right so using field level security inside dataverse was the route for us to go so ultimately when we started looking at designing these solutions we really thought about the fact that where data should live and why it should live in a certain place okay and i'm just going to check the chat if there's any questions right and that was really 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 important uh so carlson said another nice example around pii is uh commenting so mentioning uh feature introduced in power automate yeah absolutely power apps and power virtual agents guess where this data is stored <laughs> respect oh wow crazy crazy Yes, thanks, Carson, for putting Paul's stuff in. Oh, gosh, guys, I haven't been following the chat. Anyway, so that being said, right, that being said, we've got all this awesome data -y stuff. Uh, we're trying to pick our data sources. We're respecting the customer by choosing the right data storage facility for the right time. Now, let's get on to the thing that everyone really cares about. The thing that Microsoft charge you for is data, okay? Connecting to data or consuming data. So this is what I love, right? Everyone, everyone freaks out uh, when I talk about licensing and I can't understand why, because it's actually not that terrifying. However, as a solution architect, as somebody that designs solutions and builds solutions, I need to understand the licensing documentation, okay? Licensing is not a commercial thing anymore. Licensing, licensing has become a technical thing. It's something that we as nerds have to understand when building solutions. So, how does Microsoft license stuff? Well, it's only two ways. Connectivity or consumption. Really, that's what you're paying for. Consumption licensing is based on the amount of something used, like dataverse consumption or um, capacity. Uh, API calls, and yes, they've increased the number of API calls in the licensing. How awesome is that, right? I think it's gone up to 40,000. Carsten, correct me if I'm wrong. Something like that. Um, yep. Things like, yes, I thought so. Ha ha, brownie points. <laughs> Um, things like uh, English words, power virtual agent sessions, a, um, things like AI builder units, which are now also included in the licensing. <laughs> right. So consumption is really, really important. The consumption price typically with licensing is not necessarily negotiable. Right. So Microsoft only have hard limits on certain things and some and, and other things there. They don't they'll throttle, but they don't necessarily have a hard limit like API calls. Um, the way I like to explain consumption and the reason consumption licensing exists, okay, is imagine uh, Alex, Nicole, Carsten, and I, the four of us all go to a bar, okay, and Nicole, being Miss Moneybags, decides she's going to bring 100 pounds or 100 euros. Alex brings uh, 50 euros, Carsten brings 20 euros, and I bring 10 euros, okay, and uh, I, we all drink the same amount of gin or beer. Who wins? Chris wins because I only brought 10 euros, right? And poor Nicole has to pay for everyone. And that's what was happening in the past on the tenants, right? People were over using, basically using other people's capacity. So Microsoft put consumption-based um, licensing to keep people honest and also, you know, pay the bills, right? The second type of licensing is connectivity. Essentially, this is pretty straightforward. You're either using standard connectors or premium connectors, and you got to pay for those, right? Standard connectors are typically included in your Microsoft 365 licensing. So if you're using Microsoft 365, uh, certain plans, you'll have those standard connectors stored in there and, and, and available to you. However, standard connectors, I rebranded them to personal team productivity connectors. Uh oh, SharePoint people in the house are gonna get a bit cross with me, but hey ho. So essentially those connectors are the ones that you should be using for your personal productivity or team productivity solutions. You can use premium connectors for those, right? When you're starting to look at core business productivity, and this is where the line gets drawn kind of, it's, it's a little bit vague. SharePoint can do a lot of really good stuff for business productivity, okay? But you need to remember, most business connectors are going to be charged for, though most business connectors are premium, okay? And the reason for that is because they serve a different purpose to what a personal or team productivity connector does, right? And that's my personal opinion, and I'm welcome to criticism. So when you look, start looking at the connectors, ah, oh, got to update this slide. It's more than 500 now. Got to get my, got to get my stuff together. Uh, so yeah, basically, when you start looking at the connectors, the connectors are what makes the Power Platform awesome. Apps are cool, flows are cool, PVA is awesome. You know, uh, Power BI is epic, 
but the thing that makes the power platform sing is the data and what you're connecting your apps and flows up to. So when you're building out solutions, like I said, it's not always going to be a SharePoint solution or a Dataverse solution. It's likely going to be a solution with multiple connectors and multiple things connecting up. Now, most of us uh, started thinking about this whole thing at the very beginning, and it's very important to understand that it's all about data. Every single time, it is literally all about data. When I architect and design a solution, the first thing that goes into my head is, where is your data? I've been building a solution last week, right? And they're using ServiceNow. I wanted to know, where's your data? ServiceNow, cool, not a problem. Do I have to put a data storage facility in there to manage some of the interactions with that data? Yes, okay. SAP, same thing. The SAP connectors, okay. You might end up adding your own functionality into that connector or building something, sorry, uh, building out a connector on the side of that to do a lot of work. But again, you know, it's not always going to be a direct link to the data. You may need something in the middle, like Dataverse, to actually manage that data and push the data back out. So when I think about it, it's always going to be about data every single time. I never build an app without thinking about data. I never build a Power BI report without thinking about data. I don't even think about Power Automate until I've thought about data. Okay, every single time, every single solution I build, the first question in my head is data. Because I think about data and because I think about why data is so important and why it's important in the Power Platform, the next question in my head is licensing. <clears throat> and the reason I think about licensing upfront is because number one, I need to be able to prove the cost of the solution I'm building, okay? It's easy to do a solution where you've got about, I mean, I'm working at a customer now with 6,800 per user licenses. It's awesome. Literally, it's just like, I, I, you can build anything and you don't have to really you know, make that decision. Well, you do actually, except for the fact they've got six terabytes of space or capacity outside Dataverse, which again, makes it my life so much easier, right? So they're not exactly stressed. But when I walk into another organization, you know, 10,000 users and approximately 1,000 of them are only licensed with a per user license, it's a very different story because then you really have to think about who is going to be using that app, okay? Another thing that I want to bring up here, and uh, I'm going to talk about this. I'm not going to give you a slide. The reason I'm not going to give you a slide is because I need no evidence of this conversation. <laughs> okay, I know it's being recorded. Ha ha. But there's another thing to think about when building out solutions and, and licensing a data, and that's a thing called multiplexing, okay? Now, I'm not going to show you the slide purely because it's literally just the most noisy thing in the world, but um, I will drop a link in the chat around multiplexing. But when you're building out solutions, you aren't allowed, multiplexing basically means polling or pooling connections to avoid paying for a license. Now, Microsoft talk about it very clearly in their documentation. I'm doing a session about this on the 17th, but I haven't gotten all my thoughts together, so that's why you have no slide. But multiplexing is essentially the avoidance of paying for licensing. All right, you have to think about that when, you, when you're building out your solutions. You can't go and build a solution on top of SharePoints and then um, bring Dataverse, solution, Dataverse data into that SharePoint list without paying for a Dataverse license, okay? And that's the thing. If you're using information from Dataverse, no matter where it is and how many gates you have in the way, you pay for a license, okay? Like I said, I will be more succinct in my messaging on that on the 17th, but that's something that you need to remember. It is on page three of the licensing guide. Microsoft have also come up with a multiplexing guide. It's not something you should panic about, though, because Microsoft would prefer you building something than panicking about data uh, multiplexing. Anyway, just remember, all about data. So the second last point I want to leave you with is this gorgeous thing that Microsoft have released recently uh, called the pay-as-you-go license. So I've been chatting to the product group, and... This is kick-ass, but it's going to be scary, okay? I'm not saying that's priced correctly. I'm saying that the concept of the pay-as-you-go SKU is awesome, all right? The pricing, I think, might need some, some attention, in my opinion, okay? But first of all, a couple of things to bring up here, and I will be very quick. Point number one is that in the Power Platform, you do not need a license to build an app, okay? You do not even need a, you do not even need a M365 license to build a Power App. If you have no license, you can go into make.powerapps.com and make an app, okay? It's by design. Your license is consumed on running an app, okay? So you need to think about that. When going through the process, Microsoft 365 licensing, okay, uses standard connectors, and then any um, paid for premium license will allow you to use premium connectors like SQL and Dataverse, okay? Microsoft have two consumption models for licensing, okay? The first consumption model is called the per app license. It's $5 per user per app. 
and it's assigned like a ticketing system, okay? I know that the user experience needs a little bit of work on the per app licensing, but it's awesome. The second one is this new pay-as-you-go licensing. This is cool. It basically uses your Azure credits, right? So you can set up a pay-as-you-go license against an environment and users with no Power Apps licensing can use the pay-as-you-go license. Point number one, per app licensing and pay-as-you-go licensing cannot exist in the same environments. They are both consumption models, therefore they cannot exist in the same environments. The information over here in the quotes is direct quote from one of the product managers from, from Microsoft. If an environment has per app passes you, and you enable that in, if, and you enable environments for pay-as-you-go, app passes are ignored and not consumed. Those app passes can be relocated to a different environment. Okay, so pay-as-you-go comes first, then per app. It, the solution or the system or the environment will check if you have an M365 license first, then it'll check if you have a per user license, and then it'll check if you have neither of those, it'll then go into the pay-as-you-go license, not the per app license. So when you're building your solutions, just think about that and think about the connectors people are going to be using. I thought I'd bring that up just as a brand spanking new slide, just in case you wanted to know. But yeah, pay-as-you-go is awesome. I'm excited about it. A couple of things that we'll, we will need to know around selecting limits and um, you know have, you can have exclusions and all sorts of things there. But when building your solutions, think about the type of user not maker, user that's going to be accessing your app. Okay, so to wrap up that whirlwind presentation, uh, I thought I would share something pretty cool with you. It's one of my favorite quotes in the world. Uh, it's by this dude. Some of you might know him. Some of you might not. Okay, he's not a real dude. He's a real actor. Um, so Tony Stark from uh, The Avengers, Robert Downey Jr. And there's this really cool part in The Avengers where he's like coming out of the, it's in the last film, when he's coming out of the bunker and he meets his father and he's getting the Pym particle. And if you don't know what that is, you need to talk to me. We'll get on a nerdy level. And um, he basically says, you know, Microsoft make this say this thing all the time. We want to empower every human being on the planet to do more. And I love that saying. I think it's awesome. But the only way you can do that is by providing time back to people. And the only way you can provide time back to people is, is by providing them the ability to build solutions faster, okay, and architect solutions quicker. And the only way you can do that is by using tools like the Power Platform. So no amount of money ever bought a second of time. It's really important that you remember that. And this whole debacle, this whole, this whole discussion about data and architecture and licensing is all around saving you all time and end users time as well, okay? You enable the organization, you give people the ability to create things quicker. I promise you now, right, you will see a much better result from, a, from an architectural build and a solution build perspective, okay? So thank you all very much. I know that was a bit of a whirlwind, lots of stuff to impart in 45 minutes. Um, and I haven't been able to keep track of the questions in the chat because I'm useless. I can see there's lots of information going on here. But um, if anyone would like to ask any questions, I'll stick around for a couple of minutes. Um, but yeah, I'd just like to thank everyone that organized the event. So Jorgen and, and team and Ludwig and, and everyone, thank you so much for having me. And thank you for everyone um, for joining this call. It was really awesome to chat to you all. And uh, I'm going to go look through microscopes again. So yeah, any questions, please fire away. Cool. Thank you very much for joining, Chris. Uh, who has, I'm sure someone has a lot of questions. Uh, let us know. Yeah, you guys can always hit me up um, wherever you want. I mean, LinkedIn, Twitter, send me a carrier pigeon or a smoke signal. I'm, I'm cool with whatever. <laughs> yeah. more, more importantly, more importantly, hit Paul up on Twitter, right? Go and find him. Paul comes, he is a legend. And also, obviously, everyone on this call. <laughs> cool. No questions. No. Yeah. So there was a lot of chat messages, but no questions. <laughs> That's good. No, That's no good. question. A lot of comments here. Yeah. So well, thanks well, a lot, well, and uh, let's give him a pause. So thanks a lot. Yeah. Oh, thank you, guys. Great for joining us, Chris. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Oh, such a pleasure, guys. Thank you so much. And listen, I'll see you all very soon. Like I said, just have a chat on LinkedIn. And also, I appreciate everyone joining this. Have a fantastic rest of the day. And to the organizers, you guys are rock. <laughs> okay. Thanks a cool. lot. See you guys later. Bye-bye. Uh, have a great day. Yeah. You too.